Mark chapter 3, verse 7 to 19. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a large crowd followed from Galilee, and a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, beyond the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing towards him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, to send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the twelve. To Simon, he gave the name Peter, and to James, the son of Zebedee, and to his brother John, he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. This is the word of the Lord. If we haven't met, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor, and I have the privilege of opening up the Word of God with you this morning. Really excited about it. We are still in the Gospel of Mark. We are still in Galilee, the northern part of Israel. And we are still studying the section of Mark that is supposed to answer the question, Who is Jesus? Chapters 1 to 8, that's the agenda. And if you remember from last week, Jesus is still winning. He is doing absolutely phenomenal in terms of his public ministry and his witness, his testimony, and seeing the kingdom come in the lives of people. I opened up a, a commentary this week. It's a book of interpretation that we read with the scriptures as we prep sermons. And I saw this beautiful intro in the commentary. It said the following. Uh, you can look at it with me. Mark's gospel is concerned with presenting Jesus as the promised Messiah, the King, the Son of David, who is rejected by religious authorities and calls his followers to radical discipleship in the kingdom of God. And when I read that passage, I went, well, that's pretty much my whole sermon today. Because again, through the teaching text and the part preceding it and following it, this is exactly what we'll see. So I'm showing it to you to stir up your expectation for this morning. My theme for this morning is Jesus the Luminary. Jesus the the luminary. Do you guys know what a luminary is? A person of prominence or brilliant achievement. That's a luminary. So you can say a luminary in the medical profession or a luminary in the school of theology. A luminary is also a body that gives light. Think the sun. Think a star. Okay. So if we say Jesus, the luminary, which meaning of the word are we using? The answer is yes. As always with Jesus, it is both and. And fam, I have to tell you, as I studied the text this week, I was overwhelmed with the sense that Jesus was a legend. Well, he, he is a legend. He was a legend, he is a legend, he is just so next level that none of the descriptions that I could think of felt fitting because they say too little of him. And that's how I landed on luminary. And you'll see as we go through the text today, Jesus truly is the luminary of pretty much everything. We are going to cover Mark 3 verse 6 all the way through to Mark 4:34. Fam, that is what one calls a buffet of goodness. Be prepared to go home very, very full today. I'm excited to take you guys through it. Now, just to make sure that we are on the same page, here are six points that I'll be making as we go. Are you with me? Jesus, what do we learn about Jesus? He offended people. He drew all people to him especially broken and afflicted people. 
He was a team player, and he had the Rassi effect. He was misunderstood and called crazy and evil. He ain't heavy. He's our brother. That's a reference to the song from the Hollies back in the 70s. And he wanted people to think and to seek understanding. That's where we'll be today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open your word, we know that we will be learning these things. But my prayer is, Lord Jesus, that this won't only be head knowledge, but that it would be truth today that illuminates our minds, that brings us to a new understanding, a new revelation of you, and that those words would seep down to our hearts, the very place where our life of faith grows, the origin of our being, the center of control, and that these words and this truth would seep all the way into our hearts and influence us, both inside and outside, in spirit and in truth. We want your word to transform us this morning, Lord Jesus, and therefore we willingly submit under it. We heard how great you are this morning. We sang how great you are. We have just read how great you are. Now cement that in our hearts this morning. I pray against any distractions. I pray that we would be clear-minded now, that we would be fully present as we listen to you. I pray that in your name. Amen. Right, fam, let's go. First thing we learn, he offended people. Look at Mark 3 verse 6. Immediately, it says, the Pharisees. Now, you guys remember, in the book of Mark, we see the word immediately a lot. Jesus speaks with urgency. Jesus is at work. Jesus doesn't have time to waste. And now the Pharisees are also in an urgent state. They also don't have time to waste. They want to shut this movement down because this movement's gaining traction and it's gaining momentum. So here's what we see immediately. The Pharisees, these were people that said, we will study the word so well and so thoroughly that the day the Messiah comes, we will know exactly who he is and what he's going to do. And not even that, we are going to keep our lives free from sin and contamination from this world. We will be extra in the way that we obey the law so that we don't miss the coming of the Messiah. That's the group of people wanting to kill him. Why? Because he offended them. To such an extent, it says they started plotting with the Herodians. The Herodians weren't even a religious group of folk. They were just a liberal political party wanting to side with Rome. The Pharisees hate Rome, but they hate Jesus more. So they're willing to side with the liberals to get Jesus uh, to shut his ministry down. My word, fam, that's animosity now, isn't it? It's not like, oh, he irritated me. We have to get that guy killed now. We have to shut this thing down. And if we have to side with the enemy to kill our other enemy, then we'll do it. Why? Why? Because Jesus didn't do what they wanted, how they wanted it, fam. And here's the crazy thing. Jesus isn't secretive about his ministry. He's doing it all out in the open. And while he's doing his ministry and he's offending these people, he's actually engaging them in conversation. And he's talking to them. And he's asking them questions. And he's explaining what he's busy with. Jesus isn't being a jerk. Jesus is just the king. But because he claims all authority and because he says, I am the king, he offends people who think that they have authority. He offends people who think that they can call the shots. Jesus offended people. Let me show you our discipleship journey again. Some of you might have seen this so many times that you are actually able to describe it to me by now, which is great. Some of you might not have ever seen it. So let me just show you this quickly. We say we are a disciple-making church, and this is how we make disciples. Okay? We focus on the fact that a disciple loves God and loves people. There you go. That's what a disciple is and ought to do. And then we ask, answer the how question with a disciple knows God, a disciple commits faithfully, and a disciple gives generously. And then if you ask the how question again, we say we know God through His Word, through encountering Him and through worship. We say that we commit faithfully to transformation, to God's people, and to the mission of the church. And we say we give generously of time, talents, and treasures. Okay, if you want to be on this discipleship journey, 
If you want to be transformed as a disciple of Jesus, if you want to change and be shaped into His image, the core of this whole journey is the leading from the Spirit. The core of this whole journey is discerning God's voice and responding in obedience. The core of this journey is Jesus calling us to something deeper. And when He calls us to something deeper, He commands us and tells us what to do. And if you still think that you are Lord of your own life and Jesus tells you what to do, you are going to be offended. In exactly the same way that he offended the Pharisees. We need to see this, fam. What do you do when the Spirit brings conviction of sin? What do you do if the Spirit tells you, you just lied? Repent. And tell the person who you lied to that you lied. That is the Spirit exercising His authority over you. So we shouldn't just look at the Pharisees and go, tusk, tusk, tusk. I can't believe that they were offended. That offends me because I'm a sinful human being. What do you do if the Spirit tells you you are being selfish? I wanted to bless someone through you, but you kept it to yourself. Why did you do it? I told you clearly and plainly. What do you do if the Spirit tells you your time, your ta talents, and your treasures are being wasted? You're not using it for me. I've told you a gazillion times. Get involved. Get plugged in. Start serving. Put your hand up. But you always have these excuses. Are you offended then? What do you do if you make a degrading remark to, uh, uh, towards a fellow human being? And the Spirit goes, Yay, that's my image bearer. That's my son. That's my daughter. You will not speak about that person like that. <laughs> you don't know what he did to me. Great story, by the way, Ivan. Being a question of the day. You don't know how that person offended me and how that person hurt me. Do you guys see it? Jesus offends people. And he offends people because he's the king and he calls the shots. Do you know when we take offense from Jesus is when we feel that he's not doing what we wanted him to do. Or how we wanted him to do it. That's not the way it works. This whole journey is designed for you to be able to say yes. If Jesus says, this is what I want you to do, then instead of being offended and plotting to kill him and get him out of the way, do what he says. Because you'll see in the verses following verse 6, the people who actually did what Jesus said experienced new life, freedom, liberation from Satan, healing from their diseases. They got it all because they listened. And the people who didn't want to listen got nothing. That's the truth. Jesus offends people. If you look at verses 7 to 12, you'll see the second thing we're going to learn. He drew all people to him, especially broken and afflicted people. Okay, look at the highlights with me. A large crowd from Galilee. A large crowd from Judea. Stop, stop. Galilee is all the way north in Israel. Judea is all the way down south. And the word large doesn't mean a thousand or two thousand people. The word large here in Greek is plethos, which is we, where we get the English word, a plethora of people. Do you know when you use the word plethora? When much or multitude just isn't enough to describe it. This was a colossal crowd from everywhere. It's like saying people from Limpopo and the Western Cape. Everyone came to Bloom, well, Kulsberg, and met Jesus there. Like, that is how popular he is becoming. And then just so that Mark nails home the point, he leaves his mark. Do you guys see what I did there? He, he uses names. Jerusalem, down south. Idumea, southeast. Tyrus, northwest. Sidon, north. He's ex saying exactly the same thing in verse 8 that he said in verse 7, and that is people from all over came. And a colossal amount of people. And then he repeats the word colossal in verse 8 when he says, the large crowd came to him because they what? 
They heard, fam, someone opened their mouths and started talking about the kingdom of God. Someone opened their mouths and started talking about liberation, salvation, and healing. Someone opened their mouth and said, the message is so simple, it's repent and believe, and we've seen the consequences of it or the implications of it or what happens in the lives of people. You need to come. None of these people would have been there if they didn't hear. If someone didn't open up their mouths and spoke. And what they spoke wasn't redundant arguments. What they spoke was good news. Why? Because these people were so desperate that they came from all over and that they came in such a desperate way that they almost crushed Jesus. It's chaotic. It's really busy. Probably very stinky as well. Because there are a lot of people that come from the margins. And then look what happens. He healed them. So the fact that he healed them meant that they were sick, fam. These were the people coming to Jesus. People who had diseases. And they were so desperate to get healed, they were pressing towards him and to touch him. And add on to the diseases some demonic activity with unclean spirits shouting. That's what you had. When Jesus was in town. Because people were desperate for good news. Sick, possessed, afflicted, marginalized people. Fam, as your pastor, that is what I desire for our church. I desire for our church to see a multitude of people coming because there's good news here. I desire for our church that people would hear that there's good news through our mouths as we speak it and as we share it to other people. I desire for our church that we would have afflicted people, that we would have sick people, that we would have demon-possessed people, because once they meet Jesus, it all changes. Once they meet Jesus, they become free. Once they meet Jesus, they find life. And once they find life and they experience salvation and liberty, then their lives are changed forever. And that cycle continues and continues and continues. Because then, a person previously afflicted has the testimony, I found Jesus and I found life. Can I take you there? That's what I desire, fam. I know we pour it all into a Sunday service and ministry programs and what have you. But my deepest desire as pastor is that we would see this. And not only that we would see sick, possessed, afflicted, marginalized people in our church, but that we would see the healing and the freedom that comes with the gospel. Can you guys imagine if we have a multitude of people coming sick, possessed, and uh, afflicted, and they leave saved, free, made new as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ? It'll be a praise fest. People will flush out into South Street and go, praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. <clears throat> I can't sing. My bad. That's what I long to see. Joseph Parker once said, Preach to the suffering, and you'll never lack a congregation. There is a broken heart in every pew. So I want to ask you, are you suffering today? And do you have a broken heart? Because the truth of the gospel is that today is the day of salvation. Jesus has been in the saving game since this scene. And he still is in the saving game. He came to die so that our sins would be covered. So that we could be forgiven. So that we can be in right relationship with God again. Luckily he didn't stay dead. He got resurrected from the dead. Which means that he made a way for us to experience new life. We call it abundant life, everlasting life, the life everlasting. And that life starts now. So he defeated sin, Satan, and death. And then goes, you can have it all. Through my grace, through my mercy, and through my love for you, you can have it all. You don't need to jump a hoop. You don't need to write a test. The only thing you need to do is admit your sins. Believe in Jesus Christ and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. That's it. Then you're in. That'll offend some people who believe that you should always keep to the rules. Jesus didn't mind offending those people. Because He doesn't play according to worldly rules. He plays according to His rules. Don't miss the opportunity. Because what I can tell you, not by the power vested in me, but by the power in the gospel, 
is if you submit your life to Jesus Christ, He will take you, He will save you, and He will resurrect you, regenerate you, and transform you. And that is a beautiful, lifelong journey of awesomeness and intimacy and transformation. Don't miss out on it. Jesus came for especially broken and afflicted people. Let's look at the third one. He was a team player, and he had the Rassi effect. Just to make sure that you guys know where, where I'm headed, Rassi Erasmus was the coach of the Springbok national rugby team in the 2019 World Cup, when we won the World Cup. Then he became director of rugby. We had another head coach. His name is Jacques Nienaber. And Rassi and Jacques together plotted the success of the 2023 World Cup, right? So Rassi can be deemed a legend, a luminary of the world of rugby, if you want to. Okay. Now let's look at the second part that Zimmy read. Jesus went up a mountain. Stop. What did Jesus go and do on a mountain? He went there to pray. He went there to speak to his father. Jesus didn't just call 12 oaks together. Any guys 12 who wants to, wants to play a little bit? No. This was a discerning exercise. It says in Luke, he spent the whole night on the mountain. And then he constituted the 12. I want you to see this. Jesus calling people as apostles and disciples. It's no small thing. It's a massive thing. And then it says in verse 14, he appointed 12. Okay, wait. Word 12? Where does that come from? Israel used to have 12 tribes. Israel's mandate was, be the people of God and be a blessing to the world. They didn't do it. They failed. So now Jesus goes, Israel 2.0. Here we go. We used to have 12 tribes. Now we'll have 12 disciples. And I'm going to start with these 12 disciples. Then we see a curious piece of detail. He called them apostles. That's interesting. So apostles and disciples gets used interchangeably in the Gospels. Why? Disciple means learner, student. Apostle means sent one. Where do you learn what you have to do to be sent? By being a disciple. Do you guys see it? Okay, but now Mark says, he appointed these 12, he named them the ones who will be sent to do what? This is the key. To be with him. To send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. That's the goal. That's the vision. It's exactly like Rasi said in 2019, we are going to win the World Cup. That's it. I'm not inviting you guys to get better at rugby. I'm not inviting you guys to climb the world rankings. I'm not inviting you guys to a good overseas experience. I am inviting you guys to win the Web Alice Cup. Do you want to win the World Cup? Yes, coach, while well, you're in. This is Jesus stating exactly what he wants from these 12. Be with me, go and preach, and have authority to drive out demons. That's what we're going to do. That's your vision. Then he repeats 12, and then he says to Simon, he gave the name Peter, and then we have two brothers, James and John. And then we have Simon's brother, Andrew. Okay, so two and two groups of brothers. Stinky fishermen with calloused hands who hate the empire of Rome because they sweat every single day to catch fish. And then the moment they put their foot to shore, the tax collector is there to go, oh, ten yellow tails. Nice one. I'll take seven. Cheers. And then Peter goes, but I caught ten because I have people to feed. And then the tax collector goes, <laughs> hard lines. And then he takes his fish and puts it to the side. D did you guys miss what they were called to do? Be with him. Go out and preach the gospel. Have the authority to drive out demons. Stinky fishermen. Really, Jesus? Yeah, exactly. The two brothers, James and John, born Narges, the sons of thunder, aggressive oaks. They wanted to deal with stuff decisively. That's how they rolled. In Luke 9, when they get ill treatment from the Samaritans, these two brothers say, Jesus, why don't we just call down fire from heaven? Wah! To smite these guys. And Jesus goes, gentlemen, cool your jets. 
slow your roll. I understand that you guys have big guns because you're fishermen. You can't beat everything the right way. Four fishermen. Two has an anger management problem. Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew. Philip means lover of horses. What a great CV to become a disciple of Jesus. What do you bring to the table? I love horses. I really do. But what does Bartholomew bring to the table? Nothing. What I can tell you about Bartholomew is his dad's name is Talmai. Top job, mate. You qualify. Oh, oh, yes, you do, according to this. In other Gospels, he's called Nathaniel. Then we have Matthew, the guy who stole the fish, the tax collector. Okay, so four guys of which two struggle with aggression with one guy who takes the fish daily and then gives that money to Rome, the empire which they hate. How do you guys think that bri went? <laughs> then you've got Thomas. Thomas always gets called doubting Thomas as if we never doubt. Let's give Thomas a break. We also doubt. Don't tell me that you pray a prayer of faith and go, that's exactly how it's going to happen. I don't doubt this for a second. If you do, please come and speak to me because I would like to get some of that faith from you. And then you have James, the son of Alphaeus. We know nothing more of him. The only reason why they say that he's the son of Alphaeus is because there was also James, the son of Zebedee, right? So just, just make sure who we're talking about, yeah? And we've got Thaddeus. Thaddeus actually is also called Judas in another, uh, in another uh, list. But he probably went for Thaddeus because there are two Judases. And he was around, Judas, dude, fish is ready. Uh, which one are you talking to? Ah, Thaddeus. Because we also had Judas Iscariot. Do you guys know what Iscariot means? Yeah. Iscariot means the man from Kariot. That's it. Ish. Ish was the Hebrew word for man. There you go. So you've got Judas, also Thaddeus. You've got Judas Iscariot. And the reason why Judas Iscariot gets that name is because he also came from the south. So he was also from Judea. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, ministered in Capernaum, but he was born in Bethlehem. So you had Jesus and Judas Iscariot from the south, and everyone else came from the north. Okay? And then you've got Simon the Zealot, the fanatic, the crazy guy, the guy who carries his blade around, the guy who believes the way that this kingdom will fall will be by the sword, gents. We are going to kill the empire of Rome. I'm telling you. When the time is ready, shing, I'm going to rip it out, tap, and I'm going to start stabbing people. This is war. That was Simon the Zealot. Now, can you guys imagine the two aggressive fishermen looking at the tax collector who took their fish, and then Simon the Zealot that goes, dude, check this, I've got a little, uh, yeah. let's knife him, man. Let's take him down now. And then Jesus goes, whoa, 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 gents, cool your roll. And then Philip goes, guys, why don't you just take some time and just walk around with the horses, you know? Let's all breathe. Let's go for a nice little ride around the Sea of Galilee. The, in, in Greek, they were called the Sikari, the men who carried in, around their knives. That's Simon the Zealot. And what they usually would do is they would go to the marketplace and when, there's, when they want to stir unrest, they would look at people who sympathized with Rome, and then they would literally go, and then run away. And then there would be a fight and a stabbing and a whole lot of unrest going on. Because they believed that is the, how they would topple Rome. What do you guys say? Stellar bunch of gents now, isn't it? Hey? If you had to put together a team, would you have chosen these, these fellas? Well, Jesus did. Why? They come from all over, they've got no skills, and they are a very diverse group. And that's the group that Jesus decided to reboot the whole of Israel with. Can you guys imagine how discouraged we would have been if we read Peter, PhD in economics, and his brother Andrew, PhD in applied maths, 
and also the senator of Galilee. And John, the CEO of Galilee Fisheries. And his brother James, the COO and director of the board. Do you know what I mean? Like if we read that, we would have gone, ah, well, I'm just a lowly dot, 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 fill in whatever you want. I'll never make it. But that's the whole reason why we have this list of people. Now, do you guys realize that Jesus didn't need the disciples? <laughs> Up until this point, they have done nothing. Nothing. They're just there. Loving the ride. Because Jesus is winning. But he chooses to use them. And he uses them for those three very, very, very important things. And with those three things, he says, I am calling you to something way, way, way bigger than you could ever dream or think of. That's the beauty of the disciples of Jesus, fam. I know that you wanted to branch out your family business. I'll give you something much better. I know that you wanted to buy that new house, uh, house, hello, house, in, house in Tiberias. I'll show you something way bigger. I know that you wanted to start an equine therapy center for kids. I'll show you something way bigger. Do you guys know what I mean? That's Jesus. And exactly like Coach Rasi, he's very clear on that. He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to win the World Cup. I'll make you play like a team. And I'm telling you now, we will win. And these guys played like a team. Do you guys realize this ragtag bunch of oaks changed the whole world? Hey? The lover of horses. The son of Talmai. The man from Kariot. Well, he got a different reputation. But that was his own doing. He was greedy. This is what we get to do, fam. This is our play. This is what we are called to. This is the goal. Be with him. Preach the gospel. And take your authority to drive out demons. To banish evil from the lives of people. Can I ask you a question? Were you with him this week? Because that's what he's called you to. With him doesn't mean reading verse of the day on new version. There's more to it. Were you with him? Did you open your mouth and share the good news with anyone? Did you tell someone of the incredible freedom there is in Jesus? Did you have the opportunity to either see someone set free or to proclaim freedom over someone? On Monday, I sat at the car wash and I was waiting for Lesejo to meet me there. We try and maximize our time. So we have a meeting while we wash our cars. And a guy came to me. I've seen him for a year and a half. He's a homeless guy who I know uses drugs. And he came to me for the hundred trillionth time asking me for something. And I, I, I didn't see him coming, right? So he caught me off guard. I was busy closing my laptop and I wanted to put it in my bag. And when I got up, he was right in front of me. And something just rose up inside of me and I started preaching to that guy like I've never done before. I've always been congenial and nice. But on that day, I was like, dude, listen, you are being held captive by Satan. I'm telling you that. That stuff you're injecting into your veins, it's making you a slave, dude. And until you stop, you'll never experience freedom because it's making you lie. It's crushing your relationships. You're even lying to me who's a stranger. That's quite bad now, isn't it? And I want to tell you now that you weren't created for that. You were created in the image of God. You were created to be in a relationship with Him and also you were created to work and you're not doing any of it. Instead, you're lying to me to get money for your next fix. And I want you to know that there is salvation and liberty. But it's going to stop with you deciding that I'm, not go I'm going to turn my back on this life and I'm going to move this way. His eyes were as big as this. And then he asked me, how do you know? And I said, dude, I know. You're not the only person in this predicament. <laughs> but there's good news for you and your brother standing at that traffic light and everyone who's in this position. You have family. You know that you can go back to someone. You know that there's someone that you can say sorry to. But stop putting this stuff in your veins, dude. It comes from the devil. It's making you a slave. As I stand here in front of you today, I am free. There's nothing that my brain is fixated on to get so that I can feel fulfilled. That's the difference between you and I. 
I also used to be a sinner. I also used to be addicted to alcohol. So I know what I'm talking about, dude. I didn't actually plan that sermon, but it just happened. Because I believe this, fam. Because I can't walk past that guy and go, I shame. Morning, mate. Slap. Mm. Let's go and chow at Wimpy. Jesus came for that guy. I'll follow up the conversation just by the way. I know where he lives. Well, if he first lied about where he lives and then he spoke the truth about where he lives. And I'll probably see him tomorrow morning again. And then we'll continue the sermon. Fourth thing we learn. Uh, I'll put some pace on it now. He was misunderstood and called crazy and evil. A crowd gathered again. It's chaotic again. Why? Because they couldn't even eat. That's how many people there were. Okay, great. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him, saying he's out of his mind. What? Fam, fam, fam. They grew up with this man. For 30 years, they saw that he never sinned. Never. Can you imagine having a brother that never sins? It's always your fault then. Think about it, guys. Even with his mom, can you imagine being a parent of a perfect child? Woof. That means if there's conflict, it's always your fault. And yet, when he says, I'm your creator, face to face with you, they tell him he's crazy. Okay, let's step it up one. So his family says he's crazy. Look at verse 22. The scribes from Jerusalem, the big guns, they say he is possessed by Beelzebul. And he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. Baal Zebub was a god of the Old Testament. The Lord of the Flies, he was called. And then they made up a god, Baal Zebul, who was the, the Lord of the Dung. What do flies hang around on? Flies hang around dung. So Lord of the Flies is giving someone too much credit. Let's call him Lord of the Dung. The people who were supposed to know exactly who he is calls him Lord of the Dung. In the creation story, God takes the dirt of the earth and he breathes his breath into the nose of the human. Do you guys know what Adam saw when he opened his eyes? He saw his creator face to face. Do you know how you can smell my breath? You have to get really close to me. Adam had the privilege of smelling God's breath. That's how close he was to him. And when he opened his eyes, that's the first thing he saw. And since the story of Adam, the desire from people from the Old Testament was, can we please see our Creator again face to face? We don't want this division anymore. We don't want sin to always create division between us. We desire for Him to be with us and we want to be with Him. But now your hearts are so sinful, your Creator is right in front of you, face to face, close enough that you can smell His breath again and you're calling Lord of the Dung. Think about it, fam. They are so sinful and deprived and black-hearted, they call the Creator of the universe the Lord of the Dung and His family who grew up with Him calls Him crazy. What does that teach us? That sin is still here. Jesus defeated it, absolutely. But people are still stuck in it. And as long as you are caught in it, you'll never see your Creator face to face the way that He wants to reveal Himself to you. It hurts me when people say blasphemous things about Jesus. But I understand that they say it. Because their hearts are Full of sin. Mine was too. Until Jesus gave me a new heart. And the gospel, the way that Jesus um, showed it, was supposed to be clear. He wanted it to be clear. 
He presented it as it is for everyone to see and to experience. And still people called him crazy, evil, and he was misunderstood. That means that people can say that about us too. Because we are his body. We are his ambassadors. Quick one, number five. He ain't heavy, he's our brother. Look at verses 32 to 34 with me. So the crowd was sitting again, everyone who loved Jesus, whoop, whoop, Jesus wins. And then his mother, brothers and sisters came looking for him. And then Jesus asks them a question, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? And then looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Do I see it? Jesus chooses to totally redefine his family. That's radical. Because in the first century, you weren't a part, like an individual part of a family, you were a collective part of a family. It was always we, not me. It was always us, not I. Your name mattered a whole lot. And what you did with your name mattered a whole lot. Jesus was the oldest boy in his family. Remember, at this point, his dad was long gone, and his mom was an old lady, 42. <laughs> old! Really old. He was the one who took care of the family. That's why he kept on making stuff with his hands. And now he goes. My family is whoever does the will of God. Isn't that just phenomenal? There's something more than only my family. The invitation is bigger, so be part of it. Remember, you gave your loyalty and your resources to your family. Jesus says, I give my loyalty and my resources to everyone who does the will of God. He ain't heavy. He's our brother. It means that if we become part of this family and we carry this family's name, then nothing is too hard for us. That line comes from two boys in an orphanage. The one boy had polio and the other boy carried him up the stairs. And the founder of the orphanage said, isn't he heavy? And then the boy said, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. Meaning, I'll carry him. That's actually where the Boys Town slogan comes from, still to this day. So the gospel asks for us to be all in. The lie of the enemy is that it's too heavy to carry, and it's too costly. Jesus is our brother. It's not too heavy or too costly for him. And can I just say, do you need a family? Do you feel alone? Here's the invitation. You can be part of my family. And my family takes shape in the form of a church in the world we live in. Remember who the crowd was in our teaching text. Were they the popular people? With the nice houses? With the many followers on Instagram? No. They were the sick, stinky, poor, afflicted, marginalized people. But now they've got a family. Hey, we are family. Can you guys see the joy in the house? You can have that same joy. Because you invited into his family. Last one. Let me land with this. He wanted people to think and to seek understanding. I'll be quick with this one. Look at these highlights. All of a sudden, in chapter, 20, uh, in chapter 3, verse 23, it says, He spoke to them in parables. That's fascinating. Okay, so cue the parables. The parables are going to start flowing in Mark now. What is a parable? It's a short story with characters in a specific setting, with layers and layers of meaning. Like an ogre. I'm joking. It's a Shrek joke. Still a dad of like young kids. And then 4 verse 2 says, He taught them many things in parables. And then verse 9 says, While he was teaching people these things in parables, he said, Let anyone who has ears to listen, listen. That means, tune in, be attentive, Listen to what I'm saying, seek for understanding, look again, take the story to heart, peel back the layers. If you don't do that, you're just going to miss it. That's what Jesus says. So let those who have ears hear. Okay, then look at verse 10. It says the 12 asked him about the parables. Why? Because the parables have layers of meaning. It's not a quick read and then you understand it. Like you have to sit and grapple with it. And then it says, Jesus answered them by saying, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
Everyone else gets taught in parables. And then he quotes Isaiah 9 verse 6 and he says something crazy like that uh, they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise they might turn back and be forgiven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great point, Jesus. That's solid. What on earth is he saying? Exactly. Look at the highlights. You need to look. You need to listen. You need to understand. Because in there lies the key to forgiveness. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. What happened in Isaiah? You're not looking anymore. You're not listening. You're not understanding. You have turned a deaf ear to my teaching and my word. Therefore, my favor will now be retracted from you. And now Jesus says to these people, you need to open your ears, you need to listen, otherwise you will not experience the favor of God. Do you guys see it? Okay. And then in verse 13, Jesus goes, I see the puzzling look on your face. Do you understand this parable? That's a compassionate, loving, awesome teacher wanting his students to understand. So Jesus asks, do, do you understand it? And then they go, um, well, no. And then do you know what Jesus does? He doesn't give them an F. Ooh, that's probably not the right one to use. A G. <laughs> he tells them. He explains to them. Josie said it in her cellar. God wants to be known. And he wants to be understood. And that's why he says, do, do you understand what I just told you? And then look at verse 33. He wasn't telling them fancy schmancy stories. He was speaking the word. It says with many parables like these, as they were able to understand, he did not speak a word without a parable. And privately he explained everything to them. Learners, students, seekers, reflectors, thinking, observers, that's who we are. And we cannot stress this enough. Jesus wanted people to think. And he wanted people to seek understanding. And those people are his disciples. The ones who he sent. Which means it counts for us too. What a portion of scripture. Amen. As you guys get ready to lead us in a response. Let's uh, take some time just to consider these six, these six things. If Jesus offended you recently and you gave him the <laughs> treatment, why not repent of that now, this morning? Why not say sorry now? Because you have the opportunity to do so. And you know that he didn't offend you because he was being a jerk. He offended you because he's the king of your life and you're not. Think about the broken and afflicted people drawn to Jesus. The only thing that they had to say was yes. That's the only thing that you have to say. Yes. That's it. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you forgot that you're part of a team. Maybe you forgot that Coach Jesus wants to take us to win the World Cup. Maybe you completely forgot that being with Him, preaching the gospel, and having the authority to drive our demons was the game plan. Maybe today is your day to say, Jesus, I'm realigning my life with this. When I sit down this afternoon to plan my week, that's the first thing going in there. I'm going to do that just by the way. I'm going to write down on a Sunday, where am I going to share the gospel and with who? And I'm also going to write, who do I have a message of liberation for that I'm going to share with them? I'm going to do it today so that I don't miss it because that's what coach wants from me. Maybe just a commitment to being part of Jesus' family. Maybe that's your next step. He and Heavy is our brother. And he created this family for us to be a part of it. Maybe you just have never said, cool, I'm in. Here I am, your brother or your sister. Maybe the student in you needs to come out. And the seeker in you needs to come out. Maybe you need to engage with scripture more and actually think about it. And peel back the layers of meaning and understanding. If any of that resonates with you, let me pray for you. And then let's respond in song. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for being a luminary. Thank you for being so 
awesome. We could sit in this text for days, Lord Jesus. Because it uncovers and illuminates so many things in our lives. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are repenting at the moment. That they would only find grace and mercy and love. That they will feel lavished by your goodness in this moment. I pray for anyone saying yes. That they would feel the chains of oppression and slavery fall from them. The unbearable burden of sin and death. That they would truly be regenerated in this moment. And resurrected by you. I pray Lord Jesus for everyone who has forgotten what we were called to do. Who decides now that I'm going to be busy with things of first importance. Give them the grace, the wisdom, and the courage to respond accordingly. We desire this church to be salt and light. We desire this church to transform this place, Lord Jesus. Make us those people. I pray for our minds and our eyes as we study your scripture and as we become students of your word. Lord Jesus, we can always learn something of you. I pray against the wasting of time in our lives. I pray that people would have the clarity to know where they can engage you and be with you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this church will this week see your kingdom come here in Centurion and beyond as it is in heaven. I pray that in your name. Amen. <laughs>